In 1960, when a young English woman named Jane Goodall set out to study chimpanzees in the forests of Tanzania, she broke all the rules about the study of animals in the wild. And as a result, she opened a whole new window into the lives of wild animals and shattered our accepted notions of what it meant to be human. The work made her a world celebrity. Alarmed at what human beings were doing to the world we share with other life, Goodall established the Jane Goodall Institute in 1977 with the objective of protecting chimpanzees and their habitats, and by extension, other forms of life. The Institute now has 19 offices around the world. In 1991, the Institute created a global youth program called Roots and Shoots, which now consists of more than 10,000 groups in over 100 countries. One of Goodall's most brilliant ideas is that the conservation of nature and the sustainable development of human communities are inextricably linked together, a concept that underlies much of her continuing work at the chimpanzee site in Africa. Despite her love for Tanzania, Goodall now travels nearly 300 days a year as a full-time advocate for the environment and particularly for chimpanzees. We talked in a hotel room in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And because it seemed silly to talk with Dame Jane Goodall in the complete absence of animals, I brought my Shetland sheepdog McTavish to the interview. That turned out to be a very good idea. I brought McTavish partly because um, it seemed wrong to be in the presence of Jane Goodall with no animals. Well, I'm uh, so <laughs> delighted. <laughs> <laughs> and second, because um, I have the impression that your remarkable career began with a dog named Rusty. Absolutely correct. Tell me about Rusty. Rusty, um, you know, I've had dogs all my life. Until now, I can't because I'm traveling. But Rusty was so different from all the other dogs. He didn't even belong to us. I was t walking uh, a dog that was owned by a lady who had a sweet shop, and she really didn't have time to exercise him. He was, he was a big sheep dog. And um, this little black mongrel mutt, you call him, <laughs> tagged along. And I really wasn't interested in this little black mongrel. And, and then I was <coughs> trying to teach the, the collie tricks, you know, how girl, little yes. girls do. Yeah. I was about 12. And he was really stupid, and he couldn't. And I was just trying to teach him to shake hands, give me a paw. And he just couldn't get it. And then this little black creature, who I hadn't been paying any attention to, put his paw up. And I said, oh, I see. OK, so from that moment on, we became almost inseparable, but he belonged to a hotel around the corner. He arrived every morning at six, barked at the door, went home for lunch, came back, and then went to, back to the hotel. And they didn't mind a bit. They didn't really care about him. So you have a, you, you want to realizing how much communication you could have with an animal? Was that, well, was absolutely. That I mean, yeah. you know, he would everywhere with me. He would do anything I asked. He would climb a ladder. He would jump through hoops. Uh, he came with me in those days. There weren't so many restrictions in England, and he came to, you know, um, aqua shows and cinemas. <laughs> he he was very bored with television. It was brand new back then, little small black and white screen, unless there was a film about animals, and then he would watch with great interest. Really. And I think his most amazing thing, if if he did something which he knew was bad, like stealing, then he was typical dog, you know, please forgive me, and wriggling about and lying on his back. But if you got angry with him for something which he did not understand was wrong, he would go to the wall and he would sit with his face that close to the wall. And you could say walkies, you could offer him food, nothing worked unless you went down on your knees and hugged him and said, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. Uh, it was my fault, not yours. But then he would forgive you. And we're told that animals don't have emotions, don't have feelings, don't understand. It was Rusty who, you know, thinking back to all those years I had with Rusty, when I got to Cambridge University, after being a year with the chimpanzees, and they told me that I couldn't talk about animals having personalities, minds, thoughts, feelings. Um, it was Rusty who gave me the courage of my conviction, because he taught me all those years ago. Isn't that fascinating? Because that's really, in a sense, one of the major findings of your work has been that, there, that the animals do have all those things. And yes. you said somewhere, I think, that uh, um, the line between humans and the rest of the animal kingdom is very blurry, and it's getting more blurry all the time. Tell me some more about that. 
I think it, for me, the, um, the big advantage I had in being offered chimpanzees to study is because they're like us in so many ways, like biologically. The DNA of humans and chimps is, differs by only just over 1%. The structure of the brain, almost identical, of course ours is bigger. The immune system, so similar that they can catch or be infected with, with uh, all our infectious diseases. And then with the behavior, you know, the complex social structure, the long-term bonds between family members, the, the communication postures and gestures, kissing, embracing, holding hands, patting one another on the back, all done in the same context that we do them, and obviously meaning the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it, because of this, it's very easy for people, even the scientists, when they got to know, they had to admit that you know there was all this similarity and there was a continuity of evolution, not just physical structure, but mental as well. And so it was the chimpanzees who enabled me to persuade other people what I already knew from Rusty. And I think all the professors at Cambridge, you know, they knew that I was right, but they found it difficult to quantify things like personality and emotion. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, most universities are beginning to grapple with that and offer courses in animal mentation. Really? Because uh, it's always been astonishing to me that it seems to me that, com that ordinary people with their own relationships with animals know, as you did with Rusty. Rusty sounds spectacular, but to some de degree, you know, all of us that have pets know those things. Yeah. And science was actually denying it for generations. And mm -hmm. still some do. Yes. I yes. think that the, m the main resistance these days is um, either uh, scientists who are doing rather unpleasant things to animals, and it's better to think that they don't have these feelings, yes. or you know, like people who are anything to do with the animal intensive farming or hunting, that kind of thing. It's better not to think about that, perhaps. So, as usual, we have a kind of a vested interest in not knowing. Yeah. Or, or those who feel that way have a vested yeah, interest. Yeah, we like to yeah. put blinkers on and yeah. just yeah. not think about it. In fact, you know, people have said to me, I've talked about you know the horrific conditions, say, of pigs or something like that in the intensive farms, and they say, oh, I, I don't want to know about that. I'm very sensitive and I love animals. I'm thinking, you know, <laughs> there's some discontinuity of thought here. There is, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there absolutely is. Yeah. And we, we love some and we eat some. It just seems to be. Uh, yeah. yeah. Another one of your phrases, you're, here you are, you're Dame Jane Goodall, you're revered around the world, Distinguished beyond anything you could have imagined when our paths almost crossed in 1965. I, I knew Vernon Reynolds, who subsequently oh, yes. came on to work with yes. you. And, and yes. uh, um, but the phrase I hear you speak that seems to come from deep inside you is deep shame. You obviously feel that very strongly. How is that? I feel deep shame because, you know, always I'm talking to people about similarities between chimpanzees and humans, and they're very obvious. But quite clearly, there are differences, and it's from, you know, from the platform of similarity that we can ask ourselves, well, what what's, what does make us unique? And I believe it's the explosive development of the human intellect, so that, you know, we we're obviously the most intellectual being that's ever walked on this planet. So how come then that we're destroying the planet, and? When I look at my grandchildren, my sisters, or the little kids I'm meeting as I travel around the world, and I think how we've harmed the planet since I was that age, that's when I feel this deep shame. Mm -hmm. Which drives you to do a number of things about it, um, one of them being Roots and Shoots. Tell me about Roots and Shoots. Roots and Shoots began in 1991 in Tanzania with a group of 12 high school students. And they came to learn more about animals because they weren't learning at school and they weren't learning anything about the environment at school. So we talked about all these things and they became increasingly shocked and eventually decided, well, they would like to do something about some of these things themselves since governments weren't and the schools weren't. And so we started a sort of club and they went back and got some friends involved. And that's how it began very simply, and because the chimpanzee was always, in a way, linking 
humans with the rest of the animal kingdom. Right from the beginning it was, well, choose projects that will help people, help animals, help the environment we all share. Three different kinds of projects. And it's, it didn't grow very fast, but then suddenly it began to take off, like the mid-90s. And it's now in 126 countries with about 16,000 active groups with membership from preschool through college, through university, more and more adults forming groups. Basically, every single one of us matters. Every single one of us makes a difference every single day. And if we would think about the consequences of the little choices we make, what we eat, what we buy, what we wear, you know, people then begin to make small changes. And it's when thousands then millions start making the small changes that we get the kind of change we need. But the name is symbolic. And if you imagine a big tree and then when it starts to grow, little roots from a seed and a little shoot, and you can pick it up and it seems so weak and so frail, but there is a, a magic, a life force, a power in that little seed, so strong that those little roots to reach the water can work through rocks and eventually push them aside, and that little shoot to reach the sunlight can work through cracks in a brick wall and eventually knock it down. So if we see the rocks and the walls as all the problems we have inflicted on the planet, environmental and social, then it's hope. Hundreds and thousands of young people around the world can break through and make this a better place for all living things. Because without hope, there is no hope. If our youth loses hope, we may as well give up. And you've heard a lot of youth that have, left, have lost hope. I've, I've, I was meeting so many young people who'd lost hope. And that was why it seemed important to develop this, this Roots and Shoots program. Mm -hmm. Now, when they say to you, Dr. Jane, do you have hope? And you reply, yes. And then they say, why? What do you say then? I tell people who ask me if I have hope, and it's a question I get asked all the time, that I've got four very simple, naive reasons. Uh, firstly, the human brain, it, it, we know it's capable of doing very unpleasant things like weapons of mass destruction, but it's also creating incredible technology. And I, I really believe that people are finally understanding the harm we've inflicted on the planet and are feeling a sense of urgency with climate change, global warming, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And when our backs are to the wall, you know, the human beings, the brain's always worked over time, and I think this is happening. And there are more technologies that will enable us to leave a less um, disastrous environmental footprint, both businesses and individuals. So that's one reason for hope. Second reason is the resilience of nature. We can uh, just about completely destroy a river or a, or a forest or a wetland or whatever it is, but give it time, perhaps give it help, perhaps put a lot of money into it, whatever, but it, it can come back, maybe not exactly as it was, but it can support life and become beautiful again. And animals on the brink of extinction, in the same way, can be given another chance. Uh, it was the last book I did, Hope for Animals and Their World, and I got so inspired talking to the people who were doing these things, these projects, saving these species. And then my third reason for hope is actually the energy and commitment and passion and hard work of young people once they know what the problems are and they're empowered to take action. And finally, the indomitable human spirit, you know, the people who tackle seemingly impossible tasks and simply won't give up. Like the people who are working to bring back the animals. Yes. Mm -hmm. And some of the children, too, youth. Well, wonderful to have that huge number of... Paul Hawken has a, a comments that he, um, he believes there are between one and two million organizations around the world working one way or another on environmental issues and related matters. Yes. Well, he did that book. Yeah. I yeah. made a comment for it, and he talks about roots and shoots in that book. So he does. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. he does. And he says that this is the greatest social movement in the history of the yes. world, and yes. nobody actually is noticing that it's happening. 
And it, it's not just environmental, it's social as well. Yes. I mean, look what's happening in the Middle East. Yeah. I mean, whatever the outcome, it's extraordinary what's happening. It is, it is. Uh, we, I just recently interviewed David Orton, who you, who is a deep ecologist that you may have come across. But he commented, and, and, and I hadn't heard anybody say this, but it sure rang true for me. He said that at a certain point in your development, you begin to feel the pain of nature as your own personal pain. I think I get that from a lot of what you say about this. Yes, I, I've, I have this, you know, connection with trees. And, you know, the, the sound of a giant forest tree being attacked by a, a saw, um, and then the crash as it falls to the ground, it hurts. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And another thing that, that you've often said, and I think is shared with quite a few other people, is that the damage we do to nature, we do to ourselves. Of and course. I mean, ultimately, this is what I've seen in Africa. The, uh, the human population grows. They encroach into the wilderness. Um, trees get cut down. A forest rapidly becomes desert-like in the forest when the tree cover's gone, soil erosion, um, people desperately trying to farm to feed their families, living in poverty, they can't even buy food, they have to grow it. And so gradually the environment is more and more and more compromised. And, and yes, animal species will disappear and we lose biodiversity and we lose a beautiful forest, but the people are suffering too and what's the future for their children? And this is why uh, in order to to protect the tiny Gombe National Park where the chimpanzees are. We began this program, Take Care, working with the people living around, improving their lives in a very holistic sense. And what began with 12 villages around Gombe is now in 42 villages. And it includes things like uh, the things they wanted first, more food, better health facilities, and education for their children. And then they, they began to ask for the other things that we could provide, microcredit programs, um, water projects, care for the watershed, restoring the valley bottoms because the, it was, uh, the streams were drying and getting silted up. Mm. And of course, conservation education in the form of roots and shoots in, in all the different villages. And you come out, I think, that, that at the start, they're not interested in conservation. They're not interested in these sort of environmental concerns at all. But that comes along. What, well, what makes it change? Why do they get? How do, well, they, how do they? What's the process they go through? When you're, when you're, you know, when you're literally <laughs> struggling to to feed your family, then, as I say, you cut down the last trees because you've got to grow some crops or you've got to make some money and you sell charcoal. Uh, then, then the environment gets more and more and more destroyed and then you realize that you can do something about it and still make a living. And these little microcredit programs I think are absolutely amazing and they're based on the Mohammed Yunus's Grameen Bank which has been taking some flack but I, uh, to me he's one of the great heroes of our time. And the final, the final deciding factor for us was finding really good coffee in the high hills above Gombe, um, persuading some of the um, international coffee roasters to come. They tested it. Yes, it was really good. They bought it. They're buying quite large amounts now. And so the, the farmers and the villagers are getting way more money than they ever dreamed of getting. So because the government requires them to put a minimum of 10% of village land into some kind of conservation status. They've sat down with our uh, mapping experts and arranged these 10% so that, first of all, it's a buffer all around Gombe, and secondly, beginning to move out to a much, much larger area further south where we're protecting the remaining forests. That's a very enlightened policy, the 10% the, the policy. It's uh, very far thinking. I mean, Tanzania has had good policy records. Yeah. But it's 10% of, of, of what land? I mean, if I the land, land owned by the village. Okay, which they is have communally their owned? owned as um, yes, I suppose. It was a village government, mm -hmm. but 
uh, it's pretty democratic. Mm -hmm. So with these maps, for the first time, they were able to actually see where the boundaries were on a map they never really knew before. But these maps are high resolution satellite images and you can see individual trees. Mm -hmm. And so they, they've become very excited about these maps. Mm -hmm. and well, this, this strikes me as a tremendously powerful um, development that you've, that you've achieved here. I, I spent a lot of my time in a, in a small village working at commu on community economic development, and, and I know some of those problems at a much higher level, and people are not as desperate and around here as they are there, but, uh, but this, structurally they're, they're the same problems. And the, the ability to link the ecological with the economic and with the personal concerns of the people strikes me as I haven't heard of that combination anywhere else. No, well, I think we were quite innovative, and now we're replicating it in Democratic Republic of Congo, in Uganda, changing according to the people, you know. Mm -hmm. But in all of these programs, also Congo, Brazzaville, the Republic of Congo, um, we, we introduce not only the microcredit, but scholarships for girls, because all around the world it's shown that as women's education increases, family size tends to drop. Mm -hmm. So we provide family planning information. And um, the villagers are just so pleased because their, their old culture doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. And so they know that they need, they, they can't cope with so many children. Mm -hmm. well, I've heard over and over again in these interviews people saying that, that if you can work at change through the women and the girls, but the women, or the grandmothers. I mean, Munker Roy has some wonderful programs that have to do with grandmothers yeah. as agents of social change. It seems to be universally the case that, they, that for this kind of work, women are far more uh, effective than men. Well, they're, they're, they're pretty effective because they're the ones who bear the burden of everything. And, you know, they have to somehow feed the, the, the family somehow. Mm -hmm. So if they get a little bit of education, a little bit of empowerment, and that's what we're providing for them. Do you get a resistance from the men? That's what I expected, but it turns out not to be so. So every, every village around Gombe, you know, 32 villages, they all have um, voluntary community uh, advisors on family planning, well, women's reproductive health. Mm -hmm. And they're mostly women, but there are some men in the, these uh, little groups of people. And they're advising not just the women, but the men too. And it seems to be being accepted very widely today. And the most amazing, well, to me, the most amazing thing is one man started a trend. He, he got a bit sick when he was around 40, and he had three wives and therefore quite a few children. And he knew he simply couldn't cope with any more. So he went and asked if he could have a vasectomy. And this is kind of unheard of. And yet he started a trend, so more men have been asking for vasectomies. That's a spectacular breakthrough, it seems it's to me. It's a mean. huge breakthrough. Yeah. Particularly in a place where polygamy is all right. I know. know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's a huge social Yes, yes. Social well, they change. trust us so much now. Well, that's fascinating too, isn't it? Because uh, if, uh, at the beginning, you must have been quite an exotic bird to have perched <laughs> in their tree. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> they thought I was a bit peculiar and <laughs> yes, yeah. a bit crazy, but at the same time, a lot of the people, you know, they heard rumors of this, this strange English girl, and they were completely fascinated. And so when I go, you know, some of the villages now, the more remote ones, they're just lined up to see me. I'm a, I'm a legend. <laughs> they, you know, the, the, their children have learned about me in school. Mm -hmm. Another fascinating evolution is that you started out as a scientist. I, 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 uh, you didn't, I think, see the column I wrote yesterday, but I was, um, when I was a student in London, it was the first time that I became kind of aware of your work and so forth, and you became someone that our family kind of followed a little bit, quite a young woman at that point, and, and uh, doing all this work with, with chimpanzees. And uh, I guess we all, we all felt this was really quite remarkable that you were able to do this. And we, we wondered, I think, how it would go down with the, with the other people around who presumably had a very different attitude from ch towards chimpanzees than you did. What was their attitude towards these animals? Uh, they, they, uh, they believed that they were incredibly intelligent. Uh, one man I met actually had a, a completely scarred face because 
you know, chimpanzees have taken human babies. They're hunters, mm -hmm. and their favorite prey is primates. Well, for them, we're just another primate. Mm -hmm. And this little boy of 12 had tried to, I think he succeeded, actually, in rescuing his uh, the little baby that he was looking after. And he got his face really torn apart, but he still said, well, I respect the chimpanzee. The chimpanzee was doing, you know, what, what, what nature has equipped him to do. And I was in his territory, and it, it wasn't the chimpanzee's fault. I was in his tree, and um, I was pretty amazed by his attitude. That is amazing. Mm. And the, the local legend is that when there's an eclipse of the sun, you must quickly get inside, because if the shadow uh, caused by the moon passing the sun falls upon you, you become a chimpanzee. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, isn't that lovely? Yes. <laughs> It's a lovely sort of shape-changing yes. idea, isn't it? Yes. One of those, yeah. I wonder where that, where that one comes from, what, I don't what, know. what strange, distant experience mm. people mm. have. There's another comment that's been made about you, and that is that you're, you, uh, you began as a, as a scientist, and you've since evolved into, I don't know, an activist, uh, you know, you've been called a humanitarian, a number of other things, but you're clearly doing something different with your life now than you did in the beginning. How did that happen, and how do you feel about it? Well, you have to go back to the beginning to realize that when I first went out to Africa, the dream was going to Africa, living with animals, and writing books about them. I had no idea of being a scientist, and I wanted to be a, you know, an explorer, a naturalist. So then I met Lewis Leakey and got the opportunity to, to go and learn about not just any animal, but the one most like us. And after a year, year and a half, I can't remember, I got this letter saying, well, you have to get a degree. I shan't be around to get money for you. You have to stand on your own feet. You must get a degree. There's no time to mess with the BA. You have to go straight for a PhD. So I did my PhD at Cambridge. And that's when I was told I'd done everything wrong. You know, I shouldn't have given the chimpanzees <laughs> names even. They should have had numbers. Anyway, I got this PhD and um, and, and I, I mean, the life I was leading in 1986 was really idyllic, spending time in the forest, learning more and more about these amazing chimpanzees, analyzing the data, writing books. Um, I had a, a child by this time, and he was there with me. And it, and it was just a beautiful. I was doing some teaching at Stanford University. And then I went to a conference in Chicago in October 86. And it was the first time all the different biologists studying chimpanzees in Africa came together. Just about all of them, weren't so many back then. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a session on conservation. And it was shocking. I was utterly shocked. See, right across the range, there were all these videos and slides and stories about habitat destruction and chimpanzees caught in wire snares and the beginning of the bushmeat trade, you know, the commercial hunting of mm -hmm. all wild animals for food, and the shocking decrease in chimpanzee numbers from between one and two million a hundred years ago. And back then in 86, it was thought there were about 400,000, it's less now. And we also had a session on conditions in captivity and secretly filmed footage of chimps in medical research five foot by five foot cages, uh, bleak, imprisoned just because they're so like us by people who felt that they could learn more about otherwise uniquely human diseases, and the cruel, usually cruel training for circuses, entertainment. And you know, so I went into that conference as a scientist planning to carry on this idyllic life, and I came out as a advocate, activist, whatever you want to call me. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, it, it wasn't a conscious decision. I don't remember saying, oh, I've got to stop doing that and do this. I, I just did it. Well, it's almost the personal pain thing again, isn't it? That you, you, know, you feel the pain of the animals that you've come to love so much. Yeah, it, was, it was absolutely dreadful. And of course, the more I began talking about the plight of the chimpanzees in the African range countries, you know, the more I was learning about the plight of the African people and realizing that so much of it could be laid at the door of the colonial era and the changing of local customs and 
things which, which made it impossible to, for them to maintain their old status quo with the environment. And then realizing, well, I got to talk also in Europe and in North America and then Asia, and learning more and more about all the other things we do to the poor old planet, <laughs> you know, the pollution, the poison, the, the climate change, the shrinking water supplies, the acidification of the ocean, the horrible loss of biodiversity, um, soil erosion, loss of farmland, and human population growth with the unsustainable lifestyles of one portion of the human population and the abject poverty of the other. Yeah, yeah. Tell me a little more about the, uh, about the, the impact or the, the footprint of, of colonialism. How does that show up at this point? Well, it, one, one of the, certainly one of the reasons that colonialism left such a, um, a deep impact was the well-meaning but, but unfortunate efforts of the missionaries who completely ruined the cultural um, norms that were very often in place. For example, where we are in the Kigoma region, um, there were, you, could, you could only uh, sleep with your wife when the child was five and uh, three years old. Um, many women were only having one child every five years, which is the same as the chimpanzees, actually. But then, you know, when, the, when missionaries come in with a changeover in attitude towards sexual behavior, um, people changed. And then you got this, you know, one baby every year, and. I wouldn't have. Uh, I wouldn't have guessed that, that that would be an impact from from missionaries. Well, the the missionaries, uh, you know, they 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 were the, the okay. The indigenous people had their own kind of birth control simply mm -hmm. because while you are suckling your child, unless you have unless you have high nutritional intake, which Western people do, but if you're sort of in a in a in a subsistence living kind of situation. You, you don't um, become fertile again while you're suckling your child. So if you're suckling your child for three years, the woman doesn't have another baby. Mm -hmm. But um, th this all changed. Mm. It's, a, it's remarkable. It's remarkable that it would have reached right into the, into the culture. And that kind well, this of is what they say. This is what I've been told by my African friends. Yeah. I, uh, I see no reason to doubt it. I mean, I, mm. I know of some of the impacts of colonialism. I hadn't thought of it reaching in quite at that personal level. You know? Well, of course, the other, you know, the dark side of, of um, globalization is <laughs> it's pretty obvious where, you know, a government sells off a huge piece of land to some foreign farmer who comes in to grow grain for his, his people in his country and the local cultures are pushed aside and the local people really aren't getting the benefit of this very often. Mm -hmm. And so all, all of their hundreds of years of cultural knowledge of the land and, and how to feed themselves in, in times of drought and in times of flood, the different crops, all that's pushed out more and more and more. The small farms are, are, are losing out everywhere, including in in, in North America, mm -hmm. Europe. And there's a huge loss of, of uh, I guess, a form of biodiversity too, like intellectual biodiversity or, or a huge storehouse of wisdom. That mm, just disappears, cultural biodiversity, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. It's awful. It is. It it's is. really terrible. And the, um, they say a language goes extinct almost every day. Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, you hear these people who are the last living representative of their culture. I think um, I'm, I think among the Algonquian languages here, there were something like eight in the first place, and one survives, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's only spoken by maybe twenty-five thousand people, and that's yeah. here under you know, right. better circumstances than some yeah. places in Africa. Right? Yeah, well, the yeah. same in, in um, America too, with the mm -hmm. Native Americans, the same sort of thing exactly. Yeah. Let me take you back to the bushmeat trade because that's something I think probably very few of us in this part of the world know about. And there's a place where I must say your account of it made me feel some real pain. Well, the bushmeat trade, um, as, I, as I say, is very different from subsistence hunting, where you're just 
shooting animals to feed yourself and your family, maybe your village. But the bushmeat trade is when commerce comes into it. And it's basically been able to proliferate in Central and West Africa because of foreign logging companies and to some extent mining companies. And even if the logging companies practice sustainable uh, logging, just cut down the big trees, they make roads. And as everywhere, it's roads that are really uh, doing so much damage because people settle along the sides of the road and uh, the hunters can go in, they get rides on the trucks, the commercial trucks, and they shoot everything. Elephants, gorillas, chimpanzees, monkeys, antelopes, pigs, anything, even birds and bats that can be cut up, smoked, and now they have transport to take it into the urban areas where people will pay more for it than chicken or goat. Really? Yeah. As they say, it's their culture. And it's completely not sustainable. I mean, it's abs see, in the old days, no self-respecting hunter would shoot a mother with a baby because, well, you wouldn't, because that's your future, mm -hmm. your future mm -hmm. source of food. But now, mothers get shot, and that lands us, the Jane Goodall Institute, and other NGOs, with the problem of looking after the infants. There's no meat on a baby chimp, so they try and sell them at the side of the road or in the market, and it's illegal to hunt and sell endangered species like chimps, so the government will confiscate if you persuade them. But then, what, then you're landed with all these little babies. What do you do with them? Mm -hmm. So we look, we look after them in sanctuaries. And in Congo Brazzaville, that's the old French Congo, it's the biggest chimpanzee sanctuary for orphans in Africa. We've got 147, of which more than half are now fully grown and caring for them. They can live to be 60 years old. Uh, we try desperately to find somewhere we might be able to release them back into the wild when they're older. But wild chimps are aggressive and territorial, and so if there's wild chimps there, they would probably attack any that you tried to reintroduce. Plus, they're living in, in, in a tenuous relationship with their diminishing environment anyway, so mm -hmm. to flood an area that's just about supporting a wild population, to flood it with released captives, that's, that's not good for the wild chimps. Mm -hmm. And also, these, these chimps from the sanctuaries, they, 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 they trust people, they'll wander into a village, almost surely get hurt or hurt somebody. I was, yeah, I was going to ask you what, what happens to those, um, you couldn't have said culture a few, a few decades ago, but, but clearly there is a culture that gets handed down, and, and these chimps wouldn't have that, right? So they no, they, they, they can be taught, and some of them came into captivity old enough to remember quite a bit, like making nests. Mm -hmm. um, they can be taught, you can teach the chimp what to eat, and people have done that, you know, mm -hmm. teach them how to fish for termites and teach them that snakes are dangerous and all the things they would learn in the wild, which foods to eat and which ones not to eat. It's a remarkable job, but it's a terrible deprivation, isn't it, for the young animal? Yeah. Now you've, there's a one chimp, I think, that you've mentioned in Japan that has a spectacular intellectual life. That's I. <laughs> yes. I is completely amazing, and her, her, her son, she had a son by artificial insemination, Ayumu, and Ayumi, Ayumu's intellect dwarfs that of his mother, and he has this extraordinary photographic memory. And if you, have, if you imagine two um, television screens, and on one you have numbers one to nine random, and on this side you have uh, a series of squares. So w the task is to remember the position of the one to nine and put them in the, the other. Matching squares on the yes, other. I think I'm yes. not explaining this very well. Um, but anyway, what happens is as soon as the number one is pressed, everything goes blank. But this chimpanzee can, r he just goes, Donk, one, two, three, four, five, six. And you haven't even worked out where two is, and he's done it. And he hardly ever makes mistakes. Mm. 
Isn't that phenomenal? It's extraordinary. Yeah. And his mother plays video games? His, well, his mother, has, she's learned all these different tasks on, on a video screen. Which she does with great intensity and for quite a lot of time. Yes, and he yeah. watches. Isn't that something? But, but she can't do this, this uh, memory feat. Yeah. It's like an awful yeah. savant. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. I think we're running out of time, and, and uh, I would gladly go on for a great deal longer, but thank you very much. I really appreciate this. Well, thank you. The remarkable Jane Goodall, scientist, author, activist, and advocate for wildlife, particularly for wild chimpanzees. If you enjoyed this interview, you may also enjoy our interview with Dr. Bridget Stutchbury about songbirds and our interview with Paul Watson about whales. For The Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Cameron. See you next time. <laughs>